So welcome everyone. It, it's a pleasure to be here today. I am Professor Ozuna. I am the coordinator of Black Studies. And um, it, it gives me great pleasure again to be here in celebration of Black History Month and to engage in riveting conversation with Ms. Brown Cepeda. Uh, before continuing, I would like to acknowledge and honor our indigenous and African descended ancestors that fomented emancipatory knowledge to ensure the vitality of future generations. I welcome them to this space. I welcome them into our hearts um, to inspire us with their wisdom. And I say Sankofa, and I, I, I'm going to join or invite everyone to say Sankofa. Sankofa. <laughs> Um, to just be reminded that present, past, and future are all connected, and we're connected to this web. I have some housekeeping items to share prior to continuing. Uh, so you will have the ability to type your questions in the Q&A or in the chat area, um, and I will uh, convey those questions to Ms. Brown Cepeda at the end of the, of the presentation. And we will allot about um, 10 to 15 minutes for um, conversation um, re, um, in response to your questions and, and comments. So without further ado, I'm going to present Jerry Rosa, who will present um, some brief uh, greetings and introduction. Good afternoon. I would like to express my appreciation to Professor Osuna for reaching out to me about this collaboration and for inviting me to be a part of this event. The Black, Study, the Black Studies Unit and the Black Student Union have a long history of organizing thought-provoking events, and this presentation is certainly in line with that. It is not often that we sit to think about how minorities are represented in the media but it is, it is definitely something that merits a lot more attention. Did you know that Rita Moreno was the only actual Latino performer in the original West Side Story movie? Did you know that even though Bruce Lee came out with the concept for the television series Kung Fu, the actor who played the main character was Caucasian? Did you know that Wesley Snipes is hardly given any credit for being a black superhero even though the Blade trilogy came out years before Black Panther was even developed. You have probably heard the quote, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Take the time to listen to the message that your guest speaker will share with you today so that you are aware of what took place in the past and you raise your voice when you notice that someone is trying to put out the wrong message again. Take ownership of how others portray you, because if you do not, someone else will just create their image of how they think that you should look, and that image will become the new normal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Jerry Rosa, for providing us with those thought-provoking words and, and message in response and in reflection to today's presentation. At this point, I would like to welcome and um, present our president, Daisy Coco de Filippis, who will provide us with uh, um, a few words and greetings. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Professor Osuna, mil gracias for this kind invitation. I'm very, very honored that you asked me to bring greetings. So I have just a few comments. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. In, in our quest for identity, our individual and collective histories must be found, preserved, and championed. As a Black, Indigenous, and Latina woman growing up in New York City, Ms. Brown Cepeda has done exactly that. She has described her work as a curator, archivist, and a filmmaker as a means of detailing the trials and tribulations of being an immigrant in a new country. And born of her love for history, 
her city, and her people. Ms. Brown Cepeda is the creator of the Nueva Yorkino Instagram page, a digital archive of the Latino experience in New York City. She's a producer and co-writer of Everything's Gonna Be All White, a four-part documentary for Showtime, which explores race, identity, and the meaning of being non-white in America. Or should I say the meanings? Because as she has pointed out, identity is multi-balanced. I quote, I almost use the term Latina or Latinx. She has said, I also acknowledge that it is not everything. There are multiple groups within it, just like blackness is a monolithic. Latinidad is not monolithic. I can tell you that if you ask me to describe my own identity, it has as many multiple parts as you can imagine. So given the often divisive political scene, the importance of examining issues of representation, inclusion, and exclusion cannot be underestimated. On behalf of all of us, I would like to thank you so very much, Ms. Brown Cepeda, for joining us today and sharing your experience. Mil gracias. Thank you so much, Presidenta, for those inspiring words and reflection to uh, Brown Cepeda's work and, and to this uh, talk that I know will inspire us to think further about Black representation and our collective identities um, in this country. So without further ado, I will also present uh, our esteemed Ana Maria Flores, Professor Ana Maria Flores of Black Studies, who will present, formally present, uh, Ms. Brown Cepeda. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. I'm Professor Ana Maria Flores. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Before I introduce our esteemed speaker, I want to piggyback for a moment on Professor Osuna's land acknowledgement and just uh, point out that we here in New York City are on the stolen occupied land of the Munse Lenape people. And land back is a real thing that's happening. That's the indigenous form of reparation. So we'll keep that in our heart and mind. I also want to point out that today in 1868, the great Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois was born. So this is perfect to have an event for Black Studies, for Black History Month, for Black Futures Month on this day. And I wanna share that we have a connection with Ms. Brown Cepeda's work um, specifically, uh, everything's going to be all white. One of our former students appears in episode one of season two. That's uh, Mars Lovejoy. She was my student in my BLS 161, the hip hop worldview class. And I was absolutely thrilled to see her on the screen and just feel very proud of the hard work she's doing as a communicator. So Jolie Brown Cepeda is a 2017 graduate of the Eugene Lane College at the New York University, at the New School, New School University, where she earned her bachelor's degree in film studies and minored in ethnicity and race. She's an award-winning filmmaker and archivist, born, bred, and based here in New York City. She is a second-generation Dominican New Yorker, hailing from Inwood, Manhattan, and the Soundview section of El Bronx. More recently, Ms. Brown Cepeda produced and co-wrote Everything's Gonna Be All White, a four-part documentary series on Showtime, doc, uh, exploring race, identity, and navigating what it means to be not white in these United States. Ms. Brown Cepeda's presentation today will delineate the history of racial inequalities examined in Everything's Gonna Be All White, and she will share excerpts from the documentary during her presentation. Ms. Brown Cepeda, is the founder and curator, as our esteemed president mentioned, of Nueva Yor Yorkinos, a digital archival oral history project documenting and preserving New York City, Latinx culture and history through family photographs and stories. And you can find that page on Instagram. She has exhibited at El Museo del Barrio, MoMA PS1, and San Jose, California's MACLA. She's been featured in The New Yorker, Days Digital, The New York Times, and Latina Magazine. 
Her film credits include the Khan Award winning Railroad Ties and the Tribeca premiering Doc, oh, DOC and New York City Audience Award recipient, La Madrina, The Savage Life of Lorraine Padilla. So without further ado, our esteemed speaker, Ms. Brasaveda. Thank you so much for, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, if you see me shifting, it's because the sun is really coming out right now. So I'm just trying to find, find my light. Um, I'm going to present my screen. And, you know, something that's really, really interesting about having done this, this project, this slideshow, or this presentation is that thinking about the way that this um, falls in line with the work that I did on Everything is Gonna Be All White, episode three really centered in media representation, all sorts of media from film, photography, to news outlets. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of, we're at a disadvantage when we historically talk about Black film representation. And I'll start by also saying that, this, you know, Blackness is diasporic. Um, in this presentation, I am centering uh, Black American film history and film culture. So I just want to, you know, clarify that. But we, you know, we're, we're told that we don't have a film history. We're told that we, you know, um, we think about Black film and TV representation, and we think back to the 90s and 80s, which obviously is the golden age of Black film and TV, but we have such a long, such an extensive history, and we've always been engaged in media representation. We've always been engaged in filmmaking, um, but we just don't know that, right? It's it's a history that's that's overlooked, overshadowed. So I wanted to kind of give, I, I wanted to start out by giving a very brief, um, but in-depth um, delineation of film history as it pertains to Black representation, and then end with showing excerpts uh, from Everything's Gonna Be All White. So there's this great quote that says, research repeatedly shows that in Western representation, white overwhelmingly and disproportionately predominant have the central and elaborated roles and above all are placed as the norm, the ordinary and the standard. And this comes from Richard uh, Dyer's white essays on race and culture. And when you think about this quote, I wanted to start with this because we know that when we're thinking about or talking about or, or making works that are you know, trying to uh, topple white supremacist structures in media representation. It's because of this, you know, this this white as being the standard. Um, we know that this country, colon uh, colonized countries, have been founded on colonialism, on slavery, enslavement, and you know, uh, one of the ways that power has been kept by certain groups of society is through racism, not only through racism, but racism is a very predominant ism that has been enacted. And so when it comes to TV, film, so much of what we we see and what we're we're ingesting um, has this, you know, overlying sentiment of white is the standard. So now um, I wanted to start with this, this photo. So this is a, a still from the 1915 Birth of a Nation. And I, um, when I was in film school, I actually uh, had an instance with a teacher because I was the only person to outwardly criticize, you know, the fact that that we lauded this film still in 20, well, back then in 2014, um, so much, right? But it's important to talk about this film when it comes to racial representation on screen, especially in this country. So The Birth of a Nation, um, it's one of the most controversial films in, in history. It, it was created by D.W. Griffith in 1915, in the adaptation of a 1905 novel, The Klansman by Thomas Dixon Jr. Now, this film is so important um, in many, in many ways reasons when it comes to technicalities this is 
really the first feature length film. So by being so, it's the first film that's utilizing particular um, edits, right, that are still, or editing structures that are still in use today, uh, camera movement, so on and so forth. And so its technicality is definitely groundbreaking for the time and for our cinematic history. But when we're looking at, you know, what, what the content is and how that still shows up today, you know, I, that, that's where my focus is. And so when it comes to Birth of a Nation, it's glorifying the clan at the end of or during reconstruction uh, which is when the first wave of, of the clan uh, was born um, as a you know result of black um, you know black liberation and so the clan was formed the clan was disbanded by by the US government as being a hate group that couldn't exist anymore after birth of a nation um, the clan is is born again and it's important and interesting to know I think that when you're looking at the clan today um, so much of what it is the KKK so much of what it is comes from this particular film itself the wearing of the white robes the theatricality of you know um marching down down streets on horseback with with uh, torches this is not something that the first clan did this was a complete uh cinematic convention that ended up becoming real life right and so this uh, revitalized the birth of of the kkk and this was the first film to screen at the white house viewed by then president woodrow wilson his family and staff that I mean, it couldn't be more uh, groundbreaking. And I, you know, like we have to think about that, that the first film that was shown, that was screened is a film that is so rooted in racist history, racist ideology, in blackface, in perpetuating certain stereotypes that are still very prominent today as black men in particular being aggressive, sexually deviant, black people as a whole being unintelligent, being lazy, being violent and white, you know, white society being the antithesis, the antithesis to that. So a very interesting, prov provocative, controversial, but incredibly important and poignant film to start with. This is another quote um, from Cameron Bailey, who is the artistic director and co-head of the Toronto International Film Festival. One of the most illuminating things about studying Hollywood history is that you realize that representations that seem problematic now were not fully accepted at the time. It's not that people were different or more ignorant or less progressive 30, 40, 80 years ago. Those acts of resistance happened at the time. It's not new, but sometimes that resistance was forgotten or just disappeared or was erased over time. Now, when, when we're thinking about film history, especially when it comes to the you know, early 20th century, so much of it, um, of our collective understanding is rooted in Hollywood, is rooted in uh, you know, white uh, run uh, studios, is rooted in you know, uh, the, the quote unquote classics, the Gone with the Winds, um, silent film era. But so many, uh, so, so much work was created you know, back then by, by black artists. And so I wanted to start with Oscar Michaud, who is one of the most important uh, Black filmmakers in, in Black cinematic Western hemispheric history. Um, he, you know, during the Harlem Renaissance, obviously that's a rebirth and a revitalization of Black diasporic arts and culture, but it was also, aside from music, jazz, politics, um, Arturo Schomburg, like outside of these people, cinema was also being advanced by Black artists in particular. And so Oscar Michaud, I think, represents um, something so, so incredible. You know, the, the feats or one of the feats of what it means to be Black in this country and to be Black in this hemisphere. The son of formerly enslaved uh, couple, he, he was called the Jackie Robinson of, of film during this time because he was one of the first, if not the first, in recorded history, Black filmmakers of this capacity. He made over 45 films in his career. Uh, he, he told stories that centered Black people as people, right, not as playthings in, in perpetual servitude. It's not that prior there wasn't any Black representation on screen, but that representation on screen was highly problematic, um, you know, for lack of a better word. And so his 1920 silent film Within Our Gates, I think, is really really fascinating. It's the oldest known surviving feature film made by a Black director, centering the story of a sharecropper and his wife being exploited by their white boss. Now, this is 1920. 
This is nothing. I never learned about this when I was in school. I learned much more about the extensive histories of, of Black filmmakers, producers, writers, people who have been using film to subvert white supremacy through making uh, or through producing and writing rather, everything's gonna be all white. And so Within Our Gates has a really interesting scene. I don't think we have time because I definitely went, um, I there, there are many slides left to go, but there's a scene where, um, the, the protagonist and his wife are being chased by uh, a mob of white people. And, you know, they're being chased, they're, they're about to be beaten up and someone attacks this man's wife, this man's black wife. And on screen in 1920, I mean, I, I cannot stress enough how, how revolutionary, how radical this was. There is a scene of, um, of this woman's husband attacking the man who attacked his wife, right? Subverting, subverting the patriarchy, subverting white hegemony, sub subverting what it meant at that time or what it was perceived to mean at that time to be a black person, you know, it, uh, in perpetual servitude, even though he was a sharecropper, which we know is just, you know, um, an extension of, of enslavement. Um, he, Oscar Michaud centered um, revolution, right? He he did this in 1920. So I wanted to to say his name, you know, because his his spirit is definitely one that, after I learned about him, has guided my work, and I I imagine guides the work of many Black filmmakers. And so then, you know, after 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, we see ourselves um, still as through white filmmaking as perpetual servitude. There's Hallelujah, which is an interesting film, right? Because it was a, it came out in 1929. There was a win because it was an all black film cast. However, the content of this film, uh, you know, directed by a white Texan uh, filmmaker was all about the romanticization of the South. And that's really what, what, what we see in a lot of early film history is this romanticization of antebellum period, the romanticization of a time where, and a, and a total rev, uh, revisionist history on screen of black, you know, black white race relations where everything was okay, where black people are happy and content with being in these roles of perpetual servitude. I apologize for the fire truck in the back. I will wait until the fire truck passes my, my window to continue. And so what's interesting, you know, here, I wanted to, to put these two pictures together um, as it pertains to Black folks in perpetual servitude on screen. We have 1940s Gone with the Wind, which has been banned by HBO, um, which is very, you know, um, incredible. And I think that that was a, an act of solidarity that was highly important. And then we have films like, like The Help, right, which are more contemporary films, but we still see similar, if not these same, uh, conversations, ideas, stereotypes being perpetuated. Um, Hattie McDaniel, who is on the right side in, in this upper photo, um, which is a screen grab from Gone with the Wind. She becomes the first black person ever to win an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. And while again, we say her name and we thank her for this work and for paving the way for the Halle Berry's of you know, the world and the Viola Davis's of the world, we also need to understand and, and um, you know, speak to the fact that her role as Mammy, Mammy becoming such a stereotype that still prevails, not only film history, but also prevails just racist thinking and ideology of black women. You know, it's interesting, like black women either being the sapphire, which is the sexually deviant, or we have black women as the Mammy, which is the one who is there to, no matter what she is experiencing, she is there to exist in, in uh, you know, servitude for um, the white, you know, master, boss, whatever the case may be for whatever film. And so during this time, you know, as a response to what, what he was seeing um, be perpetuated on screen, Clarence Muse, who was an actor, director, screenwriter, um, a, another incredible visionary, he self-published um, a manifesto pretty much called The Dilemma of the Negro Actor. And he basically had, had a, a section that I thought was interesting to highlight for, for this, you know, conversation where he's talking about and, and writing about, you know, the struggle that that sort of double consciousness, right, that Black actors and Black filmmakers deal with where we're caught in a trap, quote, there are two audiences in America to confront, the white audience with a definite 
with, with a definite desire for the buffoonery and song and the Negro audience with a desire to see the real elements of Negro life portrayed. And the reason why, again, I'm choosing this quote and I'm choosing to highlight um, the work of Clarence News is because despite what we are taught, Black people, Black artists, Black creatives, Black filmmakers have always been talking about, writing about, um, trying to understand their our positions as people of color, as Black people in this country through our arts and through our on-screen representation. Quote, the sensitivity around stereotypes and distortions largely arises then from the powerlessness of historically marginalized groups to control their own representation. Furthermore, in that the Hollywood system favors big budget blockbusters, it is not only classist, but also Eurocentric. In effect, if not in explicit intention, to be a player in this game, one needs to have economic power. This is by um, Ella Shohat and Robert, and Robert Stams, Unthinking Eurocentrism, Multiculturalism, and the Media. And so I wanted to, to place this here because we know, right, as we're looking at Black film history, 60s, 70s in particular, we are um, introduced, the public is introduced, the country is introduced to a, a completely different, um, you know, Black representation on screen. We have the birth of, in the 70s, Black exploitation. We have the rise of um, actors like Sidney Poitier, RIP, rest in peace to his spirit, who has guided so many of us in this industry. We have the Harry Belafontes, we have the Dorothy Dandridges, right? And so we have artists who are understanding the importance of um, you know, how, how we see us, right? And centering us as the folks in positions of power to create our own narratives. So I wanted to talk about black exploitation, uh, the blurred lines of representation, black exploitation filmmaking, um, the genre itself is an interesting one. You know, some some people um, have take take a uh, take issue with it. Others don't. Again, things are not so black and white when when we are talking about about art, but black exploitation, it's a, a, a term that was coined by Junius Griffin in 1972, who was the then president of the Beverly Hills Hollywood NAACP branch, where he came together, you know, the, the words black and exploitation. He felt that, that these films were proliferating offenses to the black community for perpetuating stereotype, right? Many, uh, many black exploitation films, including Sweet Sweet Bat, Sweet Sweetback's badass song, Shaft, um, so many others. My father and I watched a lot of black exploitation films um, growing up together, which he watched with his parents growing up together, my grandparents, even though a lot of these films are centering pimps, centering, um, you know, illicit activities, centering um, misogyny, centering sexism, centering uh, issues that are very um, much pres uh, present still today, it's also centering Black stories. This is a, a time in filmmaking where where you know um, directors, screenwriters, actors are being able to explore what it means to center themselves, ourselves, and our our neighborhoods, um, our our community in in film. So the genre is among you know the first um, to center black stories, like I said, and obviously this makes sense as it's coinciding with black with the black power movement and more conversations of race at the time. Sweet Sweetback's badass song, for example, and Shaft came out in the same year, 1971 which was an incredible year for Black filmmaking. And, you know, Sweet Sweetback's badass song talks about Black man who was selected uh, to be killed by white police officers, but then in turn kills the cops themselves. He becomes the target of a manhunt and flees to Mexico. And it was one of the most successful films um, of, of the year, grossing 15 million plus, not, ingest, not adjusted for inflation and box office sales. So I think that, you know, there's something to say about, about the fact that, that people did go to the screen. People did go to the movies. People did go, um, you know, engage in economic power when it comes to our, you know, supporting our Black filmmakers at, at, at the time. And so some, you know, you know, filmmakers who I who I personally uh, wanted to highlight, say their names and, you know, speak light to their spirits. William Greaves, Gordon Parks, Melvin Van Peebles, who we just lost last year, and Kathleen Collins. All of these filmmakers, all of these um, 
these these folks were artists um, aside from filmmaking. Many were poets, photographers, activists who centered and and saw the need to center our people and our communities um, in their storytelling. William Greaves is a member of or became a member of Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame. We know Gordon Parks. Um, he he was the first major Black film director in Hollywood with Shaft. He directed Holly, uh, He directed Shaft in 1971. Melvin Van Peebles. He was one of the most um, you know, important black exploitation film uh, directors. And Kathleen Collins, you know, th th this is the time, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, really more so 70s and 80s, where, where, where we see black women being able to um, bring our, our um, desires to the screen. So her, her two feature narrative films, The, the Cruz Brothers and Miss Malloy and Losing Ground, uh, centered black women in, in the, di the directorial field, you know, in positions of power to call shots. And so um, some, again, I'm not gonna read all of these, but the 60s, 70s, some innovations that, that you may not know, um, you know, 1960 to 1977 was a really important decade or, you know, over two decades or close to two decades of um, film representation. We have the first televised black, uh, the first televised documentary to be directed by a black woman in 1960. The first full, full feature black drama featuring an all black cast for a mixed audience in 63. Sidney Poitier becomes the first black man to win an Oscar in 64. So much um, happened, so many feats. And all of these feats, again, I wanted to present because they are by, by existing, by acting in these fields, by taking up space, we were, we are, this is a legacy of subverting patriarchy, right? Subverting white supremacy, right? Sub, subverting white hegemony. Um, all of the, the on-screen representation that, that we were, were used to seeing, um, you know, the, the narrative is sort of flipped on its head. And then comes the 80s. You know, obviously coinciding with the birth of hip hop culture and conversations and, you know, about race, identity, what it means to be black, what it means to be brown, what it means to be from the inner city, what it means to be non-white um, are being explored through through art, through hip hop, uh, rapping, graffiti, break dancing, but also through film. And so the 80s, we have, you know, obviously Spike Lee, we have Julie Dash. Um, this is really where we start seeing, you know, um, black filmmakers and black films, black cinema really take off. There's Beach Street, which was filmed in my neighborhood um, where I grew up. We have Beverly Hills Cox, the color purple. She's got to have it. One of my favorites, uh, Robert Townsend's Hollywood Shuffle, which is literally all about um, what it means to be Black in Hollywood and how hard it is to get roles that are not stereotypical. Um, we have I'm Gonna Get You, Sucka, which is a more comedic um, parody of Black exploitation films. So, you know, the 80s was able to usher in Black filmmaking that 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 was able to explore so many different facets from comedy to drama to dramedies um, to parodies. So that's that's where we start to have more um, more freedom as black filmmakers. Then the 90s, of course, the golden age of black cinema. I would also argue the golden age of black television. Um, we have obviously directors like Spike Lee, John Singleton rest in peace, um, continuing to pave the way for, for Black stories. Uh, we have Denzel Washington, Wesley Snipes, Samuel L. Jackson, Whoopi Goldberg, all, all of these people um, becoming household names. And again, you know, um, our experiences as Black people were, were able to be um, thought of and were able to be, um, you know, dealt with through through screen, but also through different genres, which I think, um, again, is a testament of freedom. You have, of course, New Jack City, Boys in the Hood, Daughters of the Dust, um, White Men Can't Jump, Candyman, Sister Act, Malcolm X, Cool Runnings. I mean, I don't know if Oscar Michaud, you know, in 1920 thought that there would ever be a film about Black bobsledders, you know, like the, the freedom to exist, the freedom to exist outside of only, you know, our um, cities and the inner city, and even though these experiences are important and are part of our collective consciousness, we also see in the 90s um, Black people just existing, right? Like, like we're just existing on screen as people. Um, we have Belly, Eves Bayou, Love Jones, Poetic Justice, Set It Off. And with TV, I mean, Martin, Fresh Prince, A Different World, Living Single, which predates Friends, as many of you, I think, know. Um, but that that's its own other contention, right? The fact that Friends 
the TV show um, was pretty much a a ripoff of Living Single. And if it weren't for for these shows, Sister Sister, Moesha, Family Matters, um, you know, we wouldn't have the insecures of today, and we wouldn't have you know Black Lady Sketch Show and all of these incredible. Um, feats that filmmakers are you know creating today so julie dash spike lee marlon riggs john singleton just a few a very very select few because there were so many incredible black artists filmmakers producers writers from from you know uh the end of the 20th century um but 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 some of these are the most notable um again some interesting facts that i all of this is things are are things rather that i learned through again my research on my my show that i created but you know um brother from another planet 1984 it's one of the first if not the first times that you know sci-fi filmmaking is centering blackness you know we are able to exist outside of um you know stories that necessarily just center destitution race um you know a so socio-political issues issues, um, we're, we're able to also exist in sci-fi. And I think that, again, comes with freedom, freedom to exist and freedom to express ourselves as creatives. Julie Dash's Daughter of the Dust, Meteor Man, Black, the first Black superhero film, Watermelon Woman, the first film about Black lesbians or, or centering, um, you know, Black lesbian experiences. And so where are we now? You know, again, that that was a very um, concise and I left out lots of things because we don't have the time. But, you know, all, all of that happened so so we could be here today exploring what it means to be black creatives, black filmmakers, um, you know, in the 21st century. So 21st century. We have so much. Um, princess Tiana becomes the first Black Disney princess, which is very important for you know children and representation. We have Jay Dockin Dockendorf's Naz and Malik, which is the first film to represent young Black gay Muslim love in New York City. Moonlight, the first Black queer film to win to win an Academy Award for Best Picture. Lena Waithe, Tracy Oliver, Ava DuVernay, Jordan Peele. All of us, again, um, creating this work, standing on the shoulders of our predecessors. And so I wanted to end with this photo um, before going into the uh, some, some clips, if there is time, of, of the show. Um, because this is this is a recreation of a great day in Hollywood, in uh, a great day in Harlem, which is now in this um, photo, a great day in Hollywood with different black directors, artists, uh, screenwriters, producers. And if you see on uh, the bottom corner um, or the bottom sitting down on the curb in the, the white suit, that is Sasha Jenkins, who is the director of Everything is Going to Be All White, who is also my, my stepfather. And so, you know, um, Hollywood is a field that has historically historically worked on, on, you know, families and has historically worked through, um, you know, families being able to open the doors for their kids and their families and their kids and their kids' kids to have a say in this field. And so as Black people, this never really happens. And so I am so grateful for my, you know, father for, for allowing me, you know, that space to be a filmmaker and express myself um, through film creatively. And so where, where do I stand and, and who am I in this whole conversation? Well, well, I'm just a girl from uptown trying to add to this legacy of Black excellence. Um, and since obviously we don't have any more time for me to share, um, I would love, I would love for everyone to go to Showtime and watch the show. Um, episode three is really centered in media and Black, you know, a Black media representation, um, you know, Latin media representation, Arab media representation, media representation as a whole, and how, you know, through um, okaying these certain modes of racist thinking through visual aesthetics of blackface and, and through um, filmmaking, you know, how that makes itself known today, what can we do, um, and how do we as Black people, you know, um, what does the Black future look like for creatives? So, um, again, I spoke very fast. Um, I tried to give all the information as possible, but I hope that that was um, informative. <laughs>
Well, indeed, more than informative. Uh, you covered so much ground in delineating the history of Black cinema. And, and again, um, specifically noting that it didn't start in the 70s, 80s, 90s, right? Um, that there's just a, a long trajectory of, of really representing the Black experience through the Black lens. And then also you talked about that multiplicity of narrative, like really showing the richness of, of Black life. And, um, and I do contend um, that everyone, and I know that you know, it, it, there's not easy access, right? But um, do um, get a 30 day sh free subscription um, to show time to see everything's going to be all white. I, I watched all four hours um, of the docu-series. And um, if, if you're claiming to be an advocate of anti-racist pedagogy or thinking, it's all there, right? Because it's not, um, a, a lot of folks, they contend that anti-racism is, is just focusing on blackness, right? Or um, the, contesting, racist narratives that focus on um, Black history or the Black experience, but it's so much more comprehension, uh, comprehensive. And um, what this docu-series does is that it, it delineates a, a history of, of um, oppression um, and, and really centers all of the groups that have been impacted um, by um, white colonialism and conquest, right? And, and really centering the um, indigenous, black, brown, Asian, uh, Pacific I Islanders as well, right? So it's just, it's such, it's so comprehensive. Um, I love the, the, the clip, but really it's just so much there that you have to, um, you know, I, I just highly recommend that everyone takes the time to um, watch the series. And um, so I, I know I can go on, but I do want to, as I um, noted in the chat, um, I do want to go through um, some of the, or all of the questions so, um, and comments. So um, one uh, participant noted the 90s were um, definitely the best, down, down, hands down. I, I miss when we have Black families who are actually depicted as dysfunctional. Um, Brown Cepeda, do you have any response to just that comment? Um, where, where families were depicted as dysfunctional, um, I would argue that when, you know, like I, when I, I watched a lot of TV growing up and I watched a lot of movies growing up and that's why I am doing what I do today. And I actually, you know, miss um, a lot of the family structures that were on TV back in the day um, that are now, you know, um, through shows like Blackish and through, you know, other uh, TV on HBO, Showtime, et cetera, are now making their, their way again. Um, but, you know, I think that that there was a little bit more freedom also, um, like like a dysfunction. Oh, yeah. Mercedes says uh, she means that they were not dysfunctional. Yeah, yeah. you know, like I think that that there was um, there's something so so sweet about um, about 90s television. And and I think that's a reason why so many people, myself included, still go back to watch 90s television. Um, I'm a huge fan of Martin. I couldn't be a bigger fan of Martin. And I and I like that show because it it shows black love and it's just black love and everything that it encompasses encompasses including, you know, making jokes on one another and making each other laugh and you know living in a situation where your friends are your family too and they just come over and so family means many different things. I think also in 90s television and I don't know, it was just done so well. It was done so well. So I agree may say this. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. So another um, student, Sumaya. Oh, and I just lost it. Oh gosh. Wait, but her comment was on Ma Rainey. And mm -hmm. okay, I found it here. Um, so Sumaya um, Hassan, uh, she notes um, the, the importance of Ma Rainey as a, a singer, a creative um, during the Harlem Renaissance. So, um, and she shares the quote, you don't sing to feel better. You sing because it's a way of understanding life. Absolutely. You know, I think that all art is a response to 
life and is a, a way that we are trying to, you know, um, make understanding of our situations, of what we're born into, of our neighborhoods, of our, you know, uh, ethnic identities, of our ethnic histories, of our national histories. And so as a filmmaker and as an archivist as well, um, that's how I am trying to process <laughs> and trying to make sense of life, not just my life, but of, you know, the lives of my family, of, of my parents, of my grandparents. So I understand where, you know, they came from. I know where I am and this is how I can use those tools um, to now move forward and, you know, um, provide a more, to provide some understanding for my future and for my children and for that legacy. And so, you know, you, you do, you do art, not because, you know, um, like art, art is hard. You know, people always say, oh, it's a, it must be easy being an artist. Not at all. You know, art is emotional. Artists are emotional. Uh, you, you feel, you process things differently. And, and so I, I um, definitely love that quote by, by Ma Rainey, um, because through art, you're able to, to truly just uh, navigate in ways that maybe words don't really... Uh, words fall short. Thank you. So just to continue with uh, some of the comments and questions, this is another comment. Um, Andre uh, Springs notes that he's reminded of a movie uh, of Fort Apache, which was hated for giving the wrong image to media, romanticizing cops and showing African-Americans as criminals. I mean, if you look at one of the, the longest running TV shows, it's cops. And what is that show? You know, it's usually showing one group of people who are wearing this uniform and they are harassing, pursuing another group of people who look very similar to all of us who are on this panel right now. And so I think that, you know, Fort Apache and, you know, I mean, just Fort Apache cops that that goes into just policing and you know that that other topic but my I mean my grandmother was very adamantly against Fort Apache especially being from from the Bronx um she she was out there protesting all the time um some of my favorite I mean New York City you know I think that it's so interesting because our city, she's like, I, like it's a character in herself. It's why I always say New York is its own character. And it's unfortunate because despite being a character, it's not just a backdrop. We are people and our neighborhoods are our neighborhoods and our enclaves are our enclaves. And, you know, despite the fact that we may have, you know, certain instances and uh, of, of violence or whatever we're, we're dealing with of illicit activity, that's not because we want to. That That's because that's how it's been created for us right? Like that is the circumstance. And so for like Paul Newman to just come up in the Bronx and, you know, arrest the black people, it's like, oh no, arrest the Puerto Ricans. No, no, no. You know? And so with, with my family, um, being so adamantly against this film, um, I was like the young, like, I was the only person in school who like knew about this film. No one like even heard of it. Um, I went to school here in the city, but there were many people who aren't from here. So I agree with you, um, you know, uh, Fort Apache, that, that, that mentality and that um, stereotype in filmmaking, in TV, in media is still very prevalent. Okay, thank you. So another comment, um, many movies that I would watch as a child now thinking back on it, they really would depict African-Americans as people who would live in poverty or do drugs or even live in the streets instead of highlighting those points where many African-Americans were actually doing film, media, acting, et cetera. Yeah, you know, I think that when it comes to on screen representation, um, black on screen representation, it's important, you know, to note that while these instances are part of our communities, you know, drugs are part of our community, um, you know, poverty is a part of our community. It's not the sole aspect of our community. You know, that that is my my issue with um with Black film representation and just media representation as a whole, the same with Indigenous representation on screen, with Latinx representation on screen, is that we are so relegated to, to these instances of, of adversity. And while, yes, we have that, we are not just that. We are also doctors and we're also just random. We, we are people. 
you know, um, and so I think that now, you know, that's better. Um, it's being better addressed, but it's still hard. It's very hard to be a black filmmaker um, because there's certain stories still, even in 2022, that networks, that the audience, that the general public want want to hear and want to see. And people are comfortable in stereotype. They get uncomfortable when when you push the stereotype. And you know, again, it's not it's not to say that that films shouldn't center or shouldn't talk about adversity, but those cannot be the only narratives that, that exist. Okay, thank you, thank you. And I think that, you know, uh, speaks to the, um, the issue of, the, of really including the multiplicity of the Black experience. And, and again, that can only, I would say in many cases, the, the black lens is, is really important in, in capturing all of the, the differences and the nuances of the black experience. So, and, and black imagination in, in these rooms where these decisions are being made because there, there are certain films that are more contemporary that I think are incredible films in terms of you know, acting, filmmaking, screenwriting, but then it get, you know, becomes complicated when they're still rooted in you know, adversity, when they're still rooted in, you know, I, I'm very, I'm very happy that, that a film like 12 Years a Slave exists, because it, it depicts something that we haven't seen before. And in the same breath, it's frustrating when, you know, I am in white filmmaker circles, and like, that's all they talk about. I'm like, but let's also talk about other films, you know, that aren't just about the struggle, uh, you know, so I think another example of that, where, where the acting is incredible, the cinematography is incredible, Precious. It's a sad story. The book is incredible. I love Push. And if you haven't read Push, you should read Push. But it's another, you know, it's another thing. Like, why is it that The Help in 2011 is the most, you know, um, awarded film? Like, what is that? You know, Viola Davis, um, every other Black actress in that, you know, film are incredible actresses and not only in their relation to their white counterparts on screen, you know, in these hyper-racialized settings. Like, that, that's what I have a problem with. But we all know, you know, the hashtag Oscars so white and, you know, that being able to thankfully open up this conversation about mul multiplicity and Black imagination. Um, so, yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, no, so we have a, a number of um, questions here. I see they're, they're just coming. I don't know if we'll be, we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll just continue. Is yeah. 305 okay as a... Oh, I'm, I'm great. Oh, I love oh, this oh, conversation. Okay, all right, wonderful. So um, Professor Flores um, has a question. Um, she noted, um, can you please uh, speak a little bit more about the pleasures and pressures of working with a father member as you do with um, Sasha Jenkins and everything's going to be all white? So the obvious, you know, pleasures is are the fact that I was able to, and I've worked with him in the past and I love working with my family. Um, it's, it's the opportunity and the freedom to have my opinions and my creative input be, be you know, taken seriously. Um, I don't know if that would be the case um, in any other setting. Um, being able to say, hey, you know, he as, you know, me as an Afro-Latina woman, my mom is Dominican, Puerto Rican, my dad is Black, Indigenous from down South, um, well, the Bronx by way of the South, I, I exist in multiple identities. And so I'm thinking about multiple things all at the same time. And my my, my dad, I say I have two dads because I think the, the step um, word, I think that's very uh, colonial because we as people of color are from communities and, and from cultures that are communal, where, where we are raised by tias, tios, father figures, mom figures who may not be biologically related to us and we don't say step. So I, I call him my second dad. Um, he raised me, you know, um, and I love him with all my heart as if he were my biological father. And so for him, though, you know, being being black, his father was black. His mom um, is Haitian. Uh, and so he's black and Haitian, but his experience is much more rooted in African-American male identity. I would say, hey, in the beginning of us, you know, creating the show, I'm like, we got to include indigenous people or, hey, we got to talk about Puerto Rico if we're talking about colonialism and things that he he wasn't trying to omit, but things that he's not thinking about all the time. You know, like when I think of colonialism or gentrification, for example, which episode two is about. Which, which, you know, um, episode two was was more about gentrification in inner cities. And I said, well, you cannot talk about gentrification if 
uh, without talking about indigenous reservations and you know talking about uh, Puerto Rico and talking about Mauna Kea and talking about uh, you know um, lands back and talking about boarding schools right and so again having episode three not just be about black representation but also yellow face right red face brown face these these other um passing the mic proverbially and quite literally to you know other people who are dealing with with the same you know the root of the same issue um when it comes to on-screen representation so i think the pressures were definitely you know me being on this project and wanting all of myself to be represented and all of my identity to be represented but that's also hard in four hours so i tried i tried so hard but everything that 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 wasn't in the show um i was able to express and that's a pleasure because I don't think I would have had that opportunity. Thank you. So we're going to pivot a bit. Um, and Mercedes, uh, who is a student, would like to know how you feel about, or yeah, how do you feel about Tyler Perry and his craft? A lot of people um, says he sets us back. I love this question because I I started in, in, in one place um, thinking about or my feelings about Tyler Perry, um, and I've grown. And I'll tell you where I was, where I'm at, and why. So I grew up with um, artist family. Um, you know, I was very lucky to be exposed to you know like diasporic Black filmmaking from like you know uh, Brazil to DR to Mexico to the U.S. And um, I had an understanding of like film um, and art and art film specifically um, that many people you know, didn't have that, 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 uh, that I knew. And many of my friends did like Tyler Perry and not watching him, not having ever had seen up until that point, a Tyler Perry film, I was very comfortable um, being someone who was in, in the echo chamber uh, talking, talking him down or beating him down, you know, saying that his work is terrible. It's stereotypical. Um, I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot when it comes to Tyler Perry to take into consideration. I am from New York city. I'm from the North. I am not from down south, even though I have lineage from down there. I don't understand culturally the south. You know, I don't understand culturally. Um, like I grew up in uh, Lukumi tradition, right? I am a priest of of an African tra traditional religion. I didn't grow up going to church, so I don't know that that experience as well, which is something that he talks about and you know in in a lot of his films. And I think that there, you know. Um, Tyler Perry films like his, yes, they lean on the caricature, but those those experiences are experiences too. And, you know, people need to feel seen on screen. And I think that he knows his audience. He's he's speaking to a specific audience. In the same breath, I had a, I knew a girl in high school whose um, grandparents super racist family, the grandparents used to love Tyler Perry because of what he was presenting. But I think that he is a person who has done so much for black creators. He, I mean, he has his own, you know, film studio. That's incredible. He, you know, um, Kiki Palmer and him work very closely and he, he, he has done so much philanthropic work and opened so many doors for, for black creatives. I think that he makes his work, like I said, with his specific niche audience in mind. And then everyone else is just able to watch it because he's at that level now. But I, you know, I don't think that that he's making films to to add to the issues of black representation. I think that he's talking to his own experiences. And I've heard interviews of him where he's like, I'm basing my characters off of my grandmother, off of the women who raised me in my family, off of, you know, the people in my neighborhood. And even though um, they may not be um, they, they may be, for lack of a better word, cringy for certain people not everyone has the same experience, right? Like Latinidad is not monolithic, Blackness is not monolithic. So we can't only want like, you know, shows like Insecure or only want, you know, uh, films like, uh, or shows, you know, that center, like like Mercedes was talking about, like 90s TV centering, you know, um, incredible, you know, uh, a middle class to upper uh, a middle class black families who are not dysfunctional dysfunction is also very real um so i think that he exists and he's important but he exists for a, a particular community and that's important too you know everyone like my, 
the Black future that I hope for, that I imagine, is one where we're all um, represented in some way, shape, or form, that there's a film or a show for all of us. Um, but it is obviously um, a little difficult when his work tends to fall in a canon that we that many people are trying to, you know, um, move away from. But I think that he serves a purpose and I'm I'm incredibly proud and he doesn't need me to be proud of him, but like just on solid, like as an act of solidarity, I am so proud that a person like him exists and that he has super quickly that, that he has been able to not just be a black filmmaker, but to acquire economic power and that he's using that economic power to now disperse to other black creatives. I think that that is one of the most direct ways to subvert white supremacy. Oh, thank you so much for that response. And, and there's there are more questions and comments. So um, Next uh, question, comment comes from Nina. Thank you so much for this and your incredible work. I'm curious about what you think about the future of Black cinema. What does it look like? Um, and just go ahead. I want Black people to exist in, like, in general, in any setting possible. And I can't wait for film to really explore that. You know, um, I want to see more Black horror films where we're not the first people to die in the first, you know, five minutes. I want to see, um, you know, more like I love Candyman, even though I have a very uh, I have an issue with like the main like a main part of it. I don't get why he would be attacking the projects um, when, you know, or people who live in project housing when people who killed him are, you know, were white racists. Um, that doesn't make any sense to me as a plot. <laughs> um, but I want to see like, like Blackula. I want to see Black people exist outside of racism. I want to see Black people exist outside of police policing um, when it comes to narratives. Uh, there are many films that I haven't seen just because I personally don't want to, to see Black people, uh, you know, being shot or killed by cops. Like, my God, that 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 is life. And even though art is a response to life, I think that it does a disservice to only center, you know, or position Black people in relation to white supremacy. I want to see Black sci-fi movies. I want to see a planet, a random planet of Black people existing somewhere. Like, there's Marvel universes. Like, why can't there be, you know, that for, you know, melanated people of all kinds, right? Like, I'm just, that's what I'm curious about. I want to see films about a girl from, you know, New York who is opening a bakery, a Black woman, and has nothing to do with police. You know, um, I want I want there to be more freedom, but I also understand that we need to address our realities and those realities are are heavy and those realities are are frustrating. And one of the ways that we're able to channel our frustration is through art, is is through filmmaking. But that's why, like, I love Insecure, because I think it's it's an amazing just show about, you know, black women who are figuring it out and they don't have it all together. And, you know, that's why I liked Girlfriends when when Girlfriends was a thing. My aunt used to watch it religiously and I would watch it with her, uh, you know, sister, sister, two black sisters. That's it. Doesn't have to do with like them dealing with someone who was killed by the cops and they had a dad in the house. Like, I love that. I just want to I, I imagine a future where, where black people can exist in all of the ways that white people have historically existed on screen. And I mean that in like, I mean, diasporically, I want to see diasporic black people, indigenous people, you know, uh, uh, I want to see films where Latinidad is only regulated to conversations about the border. I just want us to exist. I want there to be freedom. And I hope that, you know, the generations to come, like, you know, Black filmmakers, creatives are able to explore that imagination. Okay, so actually this, um, the next question speaks to um, the, what you just delineated. Um, and, th and this comes from Dr. Lang, who I know that you know, and you're close friends with. Um, so uh, do you think there's hope for a holistic representation of Blackness as compared to whiteness? I think that that there is hope because people are finally understanding and we're in a place where historically we've never had so much freedom to be able to collaborate with other black creatives to be able to use a phone if you wanted to to make a film to make a series 
a YouTube series. You know, I think that that people are understanding finally that you don't need to be invited to certain tables that have historically kept you out, that you can build your own table, you can have your own picnic, you can, you know, have your own house party and and you can, you know, make work outside of the white, you know, um, hegemonic sphere. You know, you don't need to make work in 2022 that's supposed to cater to whiteness right like if you're even thinking back to like the 80s 70s 80s 90s you know it there weren't youtubes available vimeos available um you know direct lines of communication between you know people through social media through websites um where you're able to pitch your ideas i think that that we're in a place where you know like we have so much access um even though obviously there are many doors that are closed we need to also understand that there are many doors that are open and it's up to us to take that leap of faith um i think that you know um that that when it comes to um thematics in terms of filmmaking and black representation it's all like there's always going to be you know um racial uh instances being talked about being un, uh being processed through filmmaking i just hope that that there's a time where like black creatives and i know specifically like black creatives who feel that if their work doesn't have even a scene that talks about police brutality, that they're doing a disservice to Black people. You know, I know people who say, oh, if I don't talk about this particular thing, then I'm not really, you know, talking holistically about the community. And I think, you know, it's so sad because it's like, yes, sure, you know, we need to respond to our, um, to our realities, but we also need to have imagination as well. You know, art, art is about that. Art is about, you know, bringing to life your, your wildest dreams. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that we are definitely in a place where there is so much more access. And I, I just hope that people continue to like come together, network, build and understand that they can do it. We can do it outside of Hollywood. Like you don't need Hollywood. You don't, you don't need Hollywood. Uh, you just need a platform and you can just make an Instagram account, for example, or a YouTube channel, for example, or create a website, go on Squarespace, get a website and put your film on there. You know, um, we need to understand. Oh, I think I think the last thing that that's aligned with that, like we need to also emancipate ourselves from this idea that we are we only matter and we're only, you know, good artists if we get white acceptance like that, that needs to just go out the table. I mean, I have received so much hate from white people about, you know, everything's going to be all white, how I'm a racist and all this stuff. And like, I know that's not true. Right. And if you watch the film or or the series, like, you know what it is. Um, So once you emancipate yourself from that, I think you also are like, "Ah," and that, that weight is lifted off of your shoulders for you to just create. So that's what I hope. I hope people emancipate themselves a bit more. Okay, and I, I think that um, that speaks to a question about how Black creative uh, creatives, um, documentarians, swap photographers, etc., how they can occupy um, the spaces that have been traditionally occupied by white artists, directors, producers. You're you're noting it, it create your space and don't let. Um, the issue of like economic dominance or economic, um, re- let's say restrictions be the reason why you're not um, sharing your film or your artwork um, with the world. Absolutely. You know, so many people are waiting for that call, that email, that text, that DM, that message to say, hey, I'm staffing this, you know, project and it's going to be all black people or, you know, uh, a project with very few, um, you know, uh, white folks who are going to be making decisions. Everything's going to be all white. We had an all POC team, you know, um, Dominican, black American, Haitian, uh, AAPI, I forget what it was, um, uh, the editor was half Korean, um, you know, uh, just so many people and so many people from, from different backgrounds. And so folks are ready. Fol- folks want that opportunity. So, you know, if you have an idea, just forget about the, the, um, the reins that like, you know, white, white society in general has on you. And when it comes to filmmaking, m- you know, money, you don't have to, you don't have to worry about that. There's so many, for example, filters um, or, or attachable lenses that you can even put on your iPhone for a more cinematic look, right? Like things are so much more accessible now. So um, got to get out your head, but it's very hard for creatives to get out of your head and actually create sometimes. So I understand. 
Okay, so you have provided us with such a wealth of knowledge and inspiration and connection with ancestors. And so I, I don't want to take more of your time. Um, Brown Cepeda shared with me that she's had 12 hour days for the last couple of weeks and um, has traveled um, recently to California and back. So um, with this said, I want to thank you for sharing your knowledge expertise with us. Um, I also want to um, thank all of the um, attendees. I, I do apologize that I didn't get to all of the, the questions. Oh, I do want to note that we have someone from Johannesburg, South Africa, um, here with us today. So um, thank you for attending. I want to thank um, the, uh, the Office of Student Activities for uh, sponsoring this event and the Conference Center for offering their expertise. Thank you to everyone and, um, and be inspired. V. Sankofa, Ashe. Ashe, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>